the impending wait. Hello, everyone. <laughs> welcome. Welcome back to Author Tool Belt. This is episode three, and today we are going to be talking about audiobook narration. I have some fantabulous guests with me today, and uh, why don't we just dive in? Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself, and we'll go around the table. Sure. Um, hello, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm an audiobook narrator and an actor. Um, that's me. Yeah, that's everything. <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew D. Meredith. I'm an author and I self narrate my own books and have done so far one other audiobook for another author. No, two, because one for my wife as well. Um, yeah, and I'm the author of Deathless Beast, uh, which is an SBFBO this year, as well as um, a few others as well. Uh, I'm Chag Abdallah. I am an author and not a narrator because you can hear my voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Touch of Light was an SPFBO finalist last year. Um, there's also Recall Novella, Prelude to Ashes, and A Shade of Madness, which is being narrated right now by Mr. Kevin Kemp. <laughs> so I'm also a Kevin Kemp fanboy. <laughs> uh, so if anyone watching wants to check out uh, their channels their websites all the links will be down in the description below so this to me is a big topic because not as an author but as a reader I would have a million questions as to the process of getting an audiobook done you've written your book you you're looking at getting it into a different format where do you even start would be you know, the overwhelming question. So why don't we start with what would the research be that an author has to do prior to looking to a narrator? Kevin, what would you say on that one? Mm. Um, I think the big thing to think about is, is like, what, what is your book and what story do you want to tell? Because if you're doing a nonfiction book um, and it's mostly educational, it's going to be massively different to if you're writing some kind of like comedy sci-fi or something like that you're going to want a very different voice and a very different story told um and so i think listening to samples of narrators or ideally books of narrators and and being like yeah this is the voice that i want to tell my story um then that's that's what i, I would do and, and yeah think think about what you want mostly and then find find a narrator that can tell that for you i think yeah very nice I, I would add to that, you know, it's one thing to just find an author or, or a uh, narrator that, voice that you like, but two, if you're, like, I know several authors who are like, I don't listen to audiobooks and I want to make an audiobook. Okay. If you're not going to put the time in to listen to a bunch of narrators, find a, um, find an author you want to emulate. Cause then you then it mm. becomes from a marketing point of view, right? Where you can say, well, but I want Brandon Sanderson's narrator. Now, does that mean it's for everybody? hundred percent. No, it doesn't mean it's the right narrator, even for your book. But if you have to pick a few, you know, find narrators via the authors that you enjoy, that, that you want to to piggyback off of a little bit. And that's part of marketing and say, hey, it's the same narrator as Brandon Sanderson. Can you afford it? Eh, we'll see. But <laughs> <laughs> Do a Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's it, it everything in self-publishing can get pretty overwhelming, right? And then. I, I feel like sometimes audiobooks are just like one other thing that aren't necessarily prioritized. But I'd recommend um, doing a bit of research on market sales and, and all that you can get. Um, what I found pulling the trigger and actually going forward and doing an audiobook is that you tap into a whole different group of people that you probably wouldn't reach if you didn't have an audiobook. Mm -hmm. um there are people who are exclusive um audiobook listeners and um i think brendan sanderson says that 60 or so percent of his readers are audiobook readers so um i think you know even before you start looking for narrators you're probably deciding do i want to do this or not so i i you know research costs uh, all the stuff that that we're going to talk about here basically mm -hmm. You need to watch this this chat, and then you're set. Then you can go after the narrator. <laughs> but uh, I'd say you know, re research the market, research why you want an audiobook, if you want an audiobook, 
Um, it it isn't cheap, but there are options um, to go almost like a, a trad quote unquote uh, kind of path with with um, companies like Podium, for example, who buy your rights off you and then you don't actually pay for the audiobook, but you get less royalties from it and have less control because you, you do sell them your audio rights. Um, so there's a ton of stuff that you need to research. Like, do you want to keep mm. your audio rights? Um, if uh, in the future, do you plan on maybe, you know, wanting to have a, a an option of going trad? Trad usually uh, do require you to sell them the audio rights as well. So if you sold the audio rights to Podium, that can be a little tricky and you, you'll mm. have to have different conversations. So there's all this like business side of, do I want to, it's it's the same as the business side of do I want to self publish or do I want to go trad? <laughs> uh, audiobooks, it's it's kind of like the same thing. Like if you want to self publish your audiobook, you're gonna have to pay for it, and it it isn't cheap. Um, but at the same time, you're going to access a whole different market, a whole different group of people that you would not have access to. And I'd go as far as say, as saying that audiobooks are probably a good marketing tool in and of themselves mm. because of that different market that you're accessing so um yeah i mean it it's not i'm not trying to recommend for or against um but before you do pull the trigger um i i do a little bit of research into into that kind of stuff to, to understand you know pros and cons of having an audiobook and if you want to do it yourself or not no, I think that's a good point because even um, as myself as a reader, I love immersion reading and I might have a book on my TBR, I might have it up on my shelf and I will just naturally gravitate towards books that I can immersion read with the audiobook and the physical or the ebook, right? So um, I, I think that's an, an important point is do you want to reach that market at a certain speed? Do you want to reach a different market? Um, are you okay with the, the market that you're reaching? Uh, it's, it comes down to business, it sounds like, but it also comes down to long-term logistics because you don't have to do an audiobook right away either, right? You can, you can wait, you can publish your book and then three years down the line, you can, you can look at doing an audiobook too. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can save up and, and then go for it. Um, but you know, it is, I mean, once... <laughs> It's it's like publishing in the sense that once you have that first audiobook out, people are going to ask you when the second one's coming out. So. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and I and I don't know how much of this is true still, but like when I was researching, you know, I'm writing, but I want to go to audiobook. Um, I there was the fear of uh, China was doing dictation and then basically eating up copyrights on Amazon. So people were putting up their own audiobooks six months later and. Amazon was saying, nope, this is um, plagiarism. Your book is already up because someone overseas, which they don't fight with, took it and pushed it through a, a voice yes. dictator, made it as an audio book, published it to Amazon, which wasn't contested because it came from elsewhere. And now your book is copyrighted and it was a whole fight. So I decided early on to audiobook at release date so I can mm. eat that on the mm. on the date but i can only do that if i can afford it myself or do it myself and it was a whole process to learn whether i was gonna you know lose months and months of my time <laughs> right. <I do. laughs> that's an excellent point yeah. <laughs> um so but it's things to take care of right you want to know ahead of time everything does katie does putting it up on um audible hold you up for seven years where you mm. can't even give it to trad unless mm -hmm. they re-record it or re-release mm -hmm. it or whatever. And then yeah. you're competing with your own numbers. And so there's all that. And, and you just know, don't do anything blindly, but also don't get bogged down in so much research. You get frozen up in, in fear, <laughs> get, get, get yeah. to it, get the book, get the audio book out if you can. Have a, yeah. have a buddy to like pull you out from the depths of research. If, yeah, if you exactly. get lost. <laughs> yeah. Like Andrew and I, if, if we team up and go research, we need someone to pull us out because we're both like obsessive researchers. I am too. So, yeah. I, can be, I can be buying a toothpick and I'll be there for months being like, hmm, yeah. how are they made? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I've lost count of the times that like I message Andrew or Andrew messages me and, and it's like, oh, look, this is cool. And we're like, yeah. yeah, this is really cool. And like a week later, we're still like exchanging stuff like, oh, this, <laughs> what if we go deeper into this and that and this? And then, we're like, oh, did we write this week? Oh no, we didn't. So yeah, yep. maybe we, we call, call each other out. Yeah. Stop it. Yeah. 
<laughs> Those are the best kind of friends to have, the enablers. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in, in terms of, of that in research, how does one go about finding a narrator? Listen to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say that one. <laughs> that that was, I mean, that was honestly my process because you can <laughs> you can just see the performance live. I mean, I, I Kev knows uh, I I the first time I, I heard his narration was on Kian's book, um, not Eleven Cycle, the one before that, yeah. fantastically underwhelming epic. Yeah. Yeah. And immediately I I just and <laughs> Kev is gonna blush, but I said I I I couldn't really pay attention to the story. I had to like go back and listen to it again because <laughs> I was kind of thinking about audiobooks and I was like, wow, this narrator is really good. <laughs> and I started to imagine like if if he would, you know, uh, like I started to pay attention to his range and the voices that he did to see, you know, if it would work with my stuff and all that. Because Fantastic and Overwhelming Epic is a very light, but it, yep. it's a lot more lighthearted um and a little bit towards the comedic side mm -hmm. um which is not the case of my series <laughs> so um yeah i think i think like you can maybe kill two birds with one stone if you listen to audiobooks a lot and just pay attention to to the narrator themselves yeah. mm -hmm. and see um what you like and what you don't like about their narration but um besides that i had like three websites that i two mostly actually that that i really used um find a way has this whole mm -hmm. marketplace now with with off with uh narrators who have their samples on there so you can listen to their samples and add them to your project like make a short list of narrators and then you know check what you know research deeper into into their work and, and check out which ones you like um, and there was another one which isn't uh, ACX, and it wasn't uh, the. Um, it wasn't finally. I actually forgot the name. I'm gonna pull it up again. But it's mm -hmm. this website with only narrators, and they do like hook you up with narrators to to produce the audiobook, but they don't do the distribution like ACX and Find a Way. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot the name of that website, but it was really good because it had a lot of narrators, and it it helped you like. Uh, you know, you can filter by by language uh, if, if you want, like American accent, British accent, the, the kinds of accents, male, female, anything like uh, fantasy, you know, or, or sci-fi or whatever. So the, the narrators are also comfortable with um, what you're going to, uh, you know, pitch to them. Was so it, was voice it Ahab? Two. Mm, no. Was it Ahab the Penguin? No, no, it wasn't Ahab. I, I'm... I'm it was a very good, like, it was really well set up. It was a very good mm. website. Like, the, the interface was really cool. It just didn't have the, the distribution part that ACX mm. and, and Find a Way has, but it did help you, like, uh, you know, hook up with the narrator and, and do all the process. They even offered you producers if, if you needed to. Um, I, I found them through my editors, actually, because they did, like, an article on their website um, about these guys. Uh, but it's been so long. See, Kev, that I'm just I'm proving my loyalty here. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't even looked sideways. So, yeah. um, I'm a narrator forgot. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even forgot the <laughs> the website. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there are resources like that that you can spend hours, days, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, weeks just researching voices. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of, of places that you can find your readers. Yeah, and, and Patricia makes a good comment here with, uh, I listen to a ton of audiobooks, so I've gotten very picky about my narrators. I've mm -hmm. dropped books because of the narrator. Um, that's happened to me, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, that was Michael Kramer for me. I could not listen to Michael Kramer for Brandon Sanderson. It just mm -hmm. went in one ear and out the other, and it just, it, it didn't have to do with the performance, but it had to do with the tonality of the voice. It was just too monotone for me. Mm -hmm. Um Whereas... Absolutely the same for me. I hmm. I have a really hard time getting into micro Kramer's narration. Like no, <laughs> feels no like a hot take, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it amazes really me though. Me. Like the take, like uh, it's just like music. You know, people have such different. Like my wife loves a more um, blank canvas narrator, so that she can really like 
still paint like she would mm. with reading uh, the book, you know, so that um, the, almost the blanker they are allows her to have her own um, life inside of it. Whereas, yeah, I think other people, I, I'm quite a sort of active narrator in the book. You know, I like to be present within the book. Um, and perhaps my wife wouldn't like that. Who knows? I'll have to ask her. Hmm. <laughs> mm, question time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, you know, and some narrators will work for you in one book and not in another. Yeah. Um, mm. I, I have my preferences on how I listen to my P.G. Woodhouse and secondary is Simon Preble. But his Jonathan Strange was mind blowing mm. because it, his voice just worked 100 percent better in that situation than it did for me when I was listening to a different book. So even if you find an area you like. Then listen to other books they've done to see if they have variation that mm. maybe you don't prefer. So if you do contract them, you can say, yeah, but I need you to do it with this mindset <laughs> as opposed to this mindset. And if they have a broad range, it means they can't, right? Because you're the director and, and you can give them give them that kind of direction as needed. Yeah, it, it's um, I, I definitely think it, like as an, a reader myself with uh, like Heliotrope from Palmer Pickering, I am blanking on the, the narrator's name. But absolutely the perfect choice. It's a tale of a, you know, more of a father figure. It's told through his perspective, very slow paced. It's it's a very humanistic experience. I cannot listen to that story in any other voice now because that that voice is just that character to me. And it mm -hmm. it set in very quick, and the same with Rohan from the Wistful Ascending series. Oh, Rohan, that narrator is very good. Perfect, perfect yeah, for Rohan. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. you you're really trying to uh, encapsulate your your character and and solidify what what they would come across as as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I sometimes question myself if <laughs> I used to question myself not anymore, but if I really like the book or if the narrator did just such a spectacular job <laughs> that you know <laughs> I like the book more. But I think it's like chicken or the egg. I mean, the yeah. book has to be good for the narration to be good. So yeah. Uh, but a good narration definitely enhances the experience to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that kind of takes us to the next point where uh, what kind of experience should the uh, author be looking for from the narrator? And Tiago, I think you already said it really well, was you had to go back and re-listen to the audiobook because mm -hmm. you didn't you were you were so focused on that uh, that performance. So um, any anything else that we wanted to add to that? In terms of a narrator's experience, like what should an author look for? Yeah. So if the author is looking for narrators, what kind of experience should they be should should they be keeping an eye out for as they're looking at different narrator voices and kind of kind of cross referencing it with their book? I think a really important thing to look at is is there is there experience in terms of making a book itself because it's no small task. Uh, as Andrew said, it is, it's months of work and it, it is a marathon rather than a sprint. And I've definitely had sort of beginner narrators come to me and say like, hi, I've taken on this book contract and now I have no idea what to do. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's not just the voice work, it, it's the production as well. Um, and, you know, ACX and Findaway have all these very specific requirements for the audio and if you get those wrong, you could have recorded an entire book, which has been months of work, and then it can't upload because it doesn't hit those requirements. So I think making sure that your narrator knows what they're doing <laughs> is really <laughs> important. Um, and, and, you know, everyone's got to start somewhere. So I'm not saying, you know, don't work with a, a beginning narrator, but just have an honest conversation with them and say, right, do we need to send this out to a different post-production company? Or something yeah. like that, and and being aware of what that that means too, um, and then uh, sort of aside from that technical aspect, I think there's there's then their training because a big part of making a book is the vocal marathon too. You know, if you're recording six hours a day for two or three weeks or four weeks, there's a vocal strain there, and if your narrator doesn't have that technique then their voice could change. It could become hoarse, you know, at the end of a recording. And then suddenly you don't have this consistency through through the listening. So, um, and I think you don't have to be a classically trained actor or anything like that, but you just have to have vocal technique and, and some experience in that in that longevity of, of, of speaking. Um, so yeah, I think technical experience to actually make the stuff and then vocal or acting chops to kind of back it up, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I know like when I started, I could only do minimum two hours a day. Right. 
because you got to get, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's like not being on stage for a long time, right? You know, yeah. I, right now I can sing in a baritone, but if I got to be tenor, you got to give me a couple of weeks to get warmed up. You're right. And it's the same <laughs> thing. If you're reading an audio book for weeks at a time, guess what? You're going to get a cold in the middle of it. It's mm-hmm. just going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and then you're going to have to come back at it. But once you get going though, yeah, I can do multiple six, eight hour days in a row now because I'm doing it. And, yeah. or I just know how to just, you know, take my time. Yeah. Right. So there's, you're a brand new narrator. Yes. You can charge less, but it's going to take you a lot more work because <laughs> you're still learning. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I when I, I, I say that I, I lost, I bought my mic. I had a narrator. My wife was working with who gave me some, some hints hmm. and got going on it. And I said, the worst that can happen is I lose $300 on a mic and the time to build a booth and a month of my life. Mm-hmm. And I did lose a month of my life because I got two thirds of the way through editing my first book and realized I had trashed it and had to start over again. No worth it, worth it. But I had basically filtered it three times instead of yeah. once and it just right. killed it. And it was like mm-hmm. worth the lesson. Now I know never to do that again. And yep. I did lose a month of my life and, and I love doing it now. Yeah. The tech aspect is no joke, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's involved. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just if I could just read, if I could afford to just read, I would just read. But yeah. um yeah, man. Um from from my side, like as a pure author, non-narrator, I'd say um you need to to have pretty well set, like you have to define what you're looking for, right? Because I don't think it's a matter of good or bad narration. I think it's a matter of style. Mm-hmm. Right. I think it, it it's pretty close to, to writing in that sense that, you know, there are more monotone um, narrators who don't do voices and there are people who prefer that. Um, and there are narrators who do incredible voices and, and doesn't even look like the same person. So um, you need to know what you want beforehand and don't try and, and you know, appease everyone. Just mm-hmm. pick what you think you, you would work better or you'd be happy with for your book and move forward with that right uh, if if you you want someone who does voices and you find uh, a narrator doesn't do voices doesn't matter how good their narration is it, you're never going to be happy with it right so i think first of all you have to really define like what what you want well what do you want from from your audiobook then start listening to that kind of stuff when you're listening to audiobooks or, or sample right so um if you want someone who can go really like dark, like listen, tr- try and find samples where they go darker or try and find spots in an audiobook where they're voicing like a darker moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and even if, like, I think, uh, Kev, my book was like the first book that you did that was a little darker. I, I think yeah. you had a lot of, of, of lighter stuff. Yeah. And there might have been a stigma around you is like oh no this guy is like more more suited to comedy or whatever and i think that's right. one of the reasons that I, I i was really happy that people love the audiobook because to me it was like no i i, I i'm looking I, I can see the you know i i, I can see through the veil here and i think kevin's gonna do an awesome job so um and because uh then the, the second part is don't be afraid to ask for a sample mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. of your of your stuff um uh kevin actually reached out to me because i, I was i think i tweeted something that did, i really yeah. liked your narration uh, on the audiobook and then kevin just answered me and said yeah uh let's let's chat or whatever you know because kevin's like one of the most friendly guys ever <laughs> uh and then we just started chatting and i was i was super like open with him i was like look i have no idea when i'm gonna do the audiobook because I'm still researching. I have no idea about, you know, financials and stuff. Uh, uh, stuff can be, can be really expensive with audiobooks. Yeah. I'm still looking into if I'm going to try and, and, and hold out to see if Podium wants me or yeah. if I'm going to pay it myself or whatever. And, and then I said, is it okay if you just, you know, send me a sample of, of like a, a, a few pages of my work. So I see how it, how it goes and, yeah, Kevin was was absolutely on board and and no pressure and all that. And I'm I'm telling this story like a, a little bit, you know, uh, I'm telling this longish story because <laughs> it's important to establish a relationship with your audiobook narrator, mm-hmm. right? It's not just oh, uh, yeah, 
this person's good. I'm going to, I'm going to hire them and, and we're not going to chat and it's going to be purely business. It's you have to be like on the ball with them all the time. So it, it is kind of like, you know, a relationship that, that goes on for a few months while mm -hmm. they're reading your book and you guys need to kind of hit it off, so to speak. Otherwise it's, it's really hard to, to have someone, uh, uh, just narrating your books um, in a way that both of you are going to be happy, right? That, that the, the situation isn't going to be hard for anyone. So, um, yeah, look look for, you know, I'd say potential or regardless of, of what they're narrating right now, look for, you know, the, I call it the range. I, I look for, for the different ranges. Like if a person does a, a, a voice in one way and another, I look for emotional moments to see how mm. they, how how emotional they get. Like, there are people who narrate battles again in, in almost like a monotone. It's just like, oh no, this is my narration. And even if they do voices, the battles are just and like I remember Kev, like I could see him jumping out of the seat when he was narrating my battles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and that was something I wanted, right? So um, you know, again, if you go back to your parameters, I, I guess, and, and say, okay, these are the things that I want, it it gets easier to look for them. When you're listening to, to a narration, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, how well they can do opposing genders too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because that was a big have, one because I have yeah. two, I have two females and one male, and I told Kevin this. I told him said uh, one big thing is I I have two female main characters, so I am considering you know a, a female narrator as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Christopher Novel yes. even asked about that. And mm -hmm. I think this is a good segue into that question because mm -hmm. uh, Kevin sent me, you know, a few of the female voices and I was just blown away. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> let's, let's go. <laughs> yeah. So, so you yeah. want to be thinking in terms of long-term, right? If, if you yeah. as the, as the, um, as the writer too, are you going to be okay 10 years from now listening back and going, mm. oh my, oh, so <laughs> what bad. did we On do? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, there's there's gals who can do really good dulcet male tones mm -hmm. and it works and it doesn't tear you out. And there's other times when you're like, man, they got to stop. It sounds like a seven year old girl and it's like mm -hmm. it's a woman, you know, that's OK. That's not wrong. Just mm -hmm. or or split your narrative. You can do your split narr narration, too, where you're working mm -hmm. with two different narrators. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Chris's uh, question here was, what is your approach to voicing characters of the opposite sex? Mm. I've heard male character or male narrators before really take me out of the experience because they come across as uh, too comedic <laughs> when voicing females. Yeah, mm. yeah so I, I'll be honest. My first book, I definitely lent that way. And I listened back to it and went, no, Kevin. <laughs> and as soon as I listened back to it, um, I, I kind of had a big chat to myself and I was like, what are we, what are we doing here? What, how, what, how are we telling stories and, and, and how do we want to tell them? And so I made the decision that, um, I wouldn't really think about, yeah, like a high voice or, or something like that. I would think more about how we as humans talk and we're socially conditioned as men to use our mask and our chest voice, which is a, a deeper sound. And women are socially conditioned to use more of their head voice, whether that's right or wrong, right? We can have a different debate about that. But those are the social conditionings. And and so rather than thinking about being like, oh, hello, I'm a lady, um, <laughs> I, I would speak in my own lifting tone, right? I naturally wouldn't use my upper ranges because we're conditioned not to go like that. Whereas if I'm voicing a woman character, I might be able to lift up into a higher register. But that's not like... I'm a lady. It's just like being open to a higher register of my own voice. Um, so now I approach the opposite sex exactly the same way as the, I do a man. It's just how does that person talk and how do they express themselves? Mm -hmm. um, and I've when I've listened back to my to my more recent books, I felt much more comfortable with that um, because it's ridiculous to be like. I'm a lady. You know, you just, you don't want to do that. You, you want to voice. Well, unless people. you're in Little Britain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you, uh, do, do you ever play with pitch too? I have like two characters who are just close enough. When I listen to them, I'm like, you're too close. So I just put one of them like 3% exactly. kick, and it just, okay, now it's good. And I also like playing with opposites, right? I think it's really yeah. fun. Like for, for Lynn, uh, a character in A Touch of Light, um, <laughs> I purposefully place Lynn in a deeper register because she's a warrior. She she spends yeah. her days 
trying to do the right thing and, and having to kill to do that right thing. And so she is mm -hmm. scarred. And for her to be up high in her register doesn't make any sense for Lynn. She, she's quiet and she's reserved because of all these things that she's dealing with. So she sits really deep in, in my voice. But then she has a friend called Ferrin who is this like, like endlessly optimistic guy. So he speaks really high in my register because he's having a lovely time. Um, and so that, that pitch change isn't to gender it is again to character how do they want to express mm -hmm. and then and again as you said if you've got two characters that do pitch very close in a conversation i'll choose objectives just to separate them so if some mm -hmm. if one person's objective is to calm them down in this moment they're going to speak mm -hmm. deeper and softer mm -hmm. so that's going to separate their voices just by objective rather than some arbitrary decision mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense yeah. <laughs> yeah just always blown away that kevin explains it doing the voices it just like, <laughs> switches gears. Yeah. This is the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also love yeah, Andrew's comment Andrew's here. comments are all gold. <laughs> Monty Python lady voice for the win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was laughing so hard at the comment. <laughs> so um, in, in keeping going here with, uh, with this, because uh, I think this ties in really well with the auditions. Um, when I know Tiago, you talked about, uh, your experience there and that's fantastic. But if, if someone, an author is looking to reach out to multiple different narrators for auditions, um, is there, uh, uh, something they have to keep in mind when they're doing that? Is there a specific protocol of business protocol they should keep in mind? Anything like that? In terms of numbers, you can ask as many narrators as you want to audition mm. there's no uh there's no moral issue there with reaching out to one narrator and being like mm, but i want to reach out like just everybody is fine we're, we're very used to that we're, that's and, and, and it never hurts to clarify in the email yeah. hey just so you know i am it's the same like with agents right some agents are like why didn't you just ask me like no no, no. i'm asking 50 yeah. until i find the one i want and it, it never hurts to just put a tag in the email and say hey i'm i'm soliciting multiple right looking for looking for actors to a narrator who wanted to act for me and yeah in terms of audition length, you a narrator probably wouldn't do more than five pages, and that would be quite a lot. Three pages, I find, is is very normal. Um, five pages would be the top, and then and then that doesn't have to be like one bit of the book. You could choose a couple of different bits yeah. of the book, and um, yeah. and for context, I mean, you think about it. It's not just five minutes of work. It's mm. that's could be three could be three hours yeah. depending on on the amount of work that goes into it. So because you're you're asking for free work. And um, that's not the artist's way, if we can help it. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're churning out like 50 auditions, right? Yep. That, suddenly that's a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. um, um, Thiago, can you give a, a quick recap here for Derek on how you I, and Kevin met? I heard Karen's, uh, Karen, I heard Kevin's <laughs> narration in, uh, in Kian's book, uh, Fantastic, the Underwhelming Epic of a Dead Wizard and average bard mm -hmm. and it really stood out to me and then i i followed him on twitter and started talking through twitter so it wasn't ecx or find a way yeah. or Volquent, which is the the other side ah, i was talking about uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, right. which is really good uh, uh yeah so uh we've let's say we've decided on a narrator yay, yay. uh what happens next after the audition and Kevin, what are you, you saying? Get on, get on a voice call. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's what I like to do. I like to have a a, a good long chat. Um, I'll often ask. Uh, I have like a little sheet that I ask the author to fill in, which is like questions about the book and stuff like that. So I have a read of that, and then we get in a voice chat and or a video call, um, and just talk it through. And, and and I'm super honest about yeah the way I approach books and things like that, just to check we're on the same page. Because like as as Diego said, but it's like. It's a really intimate experience, I think, because you're you're vo putting voice to someone's world, someone's passion that they've created, and to do that as just as this like cold business thing isn't isn't what we're doing here. We're we're an act of creation, and we have to we have to do that together. So that voice meeting that's so important. Um, I have uh, those I've worked with myself included, but that's just me, uh, make a, a spreadsheet <laughs> cast list uh, mm. of, of like actors they would have play. And in a particular part, like I have one character in my book who I say is Joseph Gordon-Levitt. 
in 100 Days of Summer. So it doesn't mean that anybody's got it with a butt with a British accent. What does that mean? It means it's it's how I'm going to hold myself in the booth and imagine that face in front of me as I'm basically mm -hmm. mirroring. It doesn't mean I'm going to be playing Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It means I'm going to be playing someone like Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Or, oh, all of these people need to have a Southern accent. Well, that doesn't mean anything. What kind of Southern accent? Let's yeah. chat. And we can figure out where we want them or are they all from the same city? So it's just the same accent, but different tones. And then mm -hmm. I can better nail pre nail in a lot of those characters. So there's a lot less pickup afterwards. Oh, that's so important. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, before any research or recording happens, definitely talking to the author about, do they have any uh, accents and voices and things that they want as those characters? Cause yeah, if I make a load of decisions and the author's like, uh, no, then we could have dealt with that very early on. <laughs> um, so yeah, getting, getting all that. And, and then also I think, making sure we were on the same page about time scale, because I've had definitely had authors speak to me and they're like, so it, will it be done next week? And you're like, no, oh no. <laughs> um, so yeah, making sure <laughs> everybody knows how long audiobooks take. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's always longer it, than you think. <laughs> probably a good opportunity, especially if you're writing a uh, fantasy to discuss pronunciations. Oh and yeah. Be on, on, you know, same page with that. <laughs> Especially those places. How do you want like, the umlauts pronounced? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like C Y apostrophe T H Z, and you're like, huh. <laughs> yeah. How, how, are we doing, how are we doing that then? <laughs> That's a sneeze. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that is. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> but before we move forward, then uh, let's cover some terminology because uh, Kevin, you have a fantastic article that you've written about this process as well, and you talk about a couple of uh, acronyms that are, I will be plainly honest, gibberish to me. Uh, so why, why don't we go ahead and explain them there? Uh, PFH is the first one. Cool. So that's per finished hour. Uh, and that's the rate that narrators are paid in. So um, if your book is predicted uh, to be 10 hours long, and there's a, a wonderful fun equation that we do to find out how long your book will be to the words that it has, um, that gives you an estimate of 10 hours long. And then the narrator is paid on the finished length of the book, the finished audio hours per finished hour. And it doesn't matter if the narrator takes 17 million years to create those 10 hours, they're only paid for those 10 hours. And I think it's important to note as well that that's just an estimate at the beginning. We only have that final runtime at the end of the process. I can only tell you the real amount it will cost once it's finished, um, which is obviously very different to many products that we buy. Um, but we, yeah, we can give a fairly close prediction of, of how long it will be. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, per P PFH, per finished hour, the number of finished audio hours we have is how much we're paid. Beautiful. And uh, QC, which um, I think is quality control on that one, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, that's... Um, so once we finish the book, uh, and it's all edited, and essentially it, it's ready to go. It's the finished product. Um, it, it should go through QC, quality control. And that's just a listen back with script in hand, just to check we caught everything, any weird sounds or any missed words. And it does go through proofing before, uh, a listen before to make sure we catch everything. But QC is just that, that last bit. And I do find most of my clients like to do that themselves. They like to listen back to the book themselves and just QC themselves. Uh, but obviously I can do it if they prefer me to do Very it. Nice. And that's also the last check to make sure that you're within that, what is it, 10% threshold for Amazon? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is a huge threshold. And, you know, it, you're, I can't imagine a book being that far off. Yeah. Even <laughs> even with umlauts, even with umlauts. Um, <laughs> but but uh, having that last quality control ensures that it is full match so that when it's being listened to um, through, uh, what is it called on Amazon? The, Whisper um, Sync. Whis Whis Whisper Sync mm -hmm. has to be within a 10% because it's not actually following word by word. It's following a gauge mm -hmm. of, of about where you're, where you're reading if you're doing an immersion read. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. And uh, I, I do okay. like you see my books because it helps me um, just, you know, check like how how stuff is 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 moving pacing wise i think and um it also does help you find those last few typos if there are any so yeah 
And plus, we get to have a massive nerd out as well and be like, oh, yeah, yeah when this yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually have a question in relation to this. Um, do you ever speed up the audio to see if it sounds good up to a certain speed? Mm. I don't. Uh, I know a lot of people listen at like 1.5 all the way up to 2 and maybe faster. Um, I, I don't speed it up because as, as far as I'm concerned, I'm I'm performing to the to the speed that I'm narrating it to. I I must say more more recently I've tried to add a little bit of pacing to my narrating because I know people listen faster. So I'm like I want to try and help you not be bored. Um so but I don't listen back faster cuz cuz my theory is this is how it will be listened to but obviously I, people can listen to stuff however they like but that's my yeah practice. And I don't know how I would speed it up in, in Audacity without it having going up to a high pitch <laughs> versus the whatever program they use for um, on, on all the sites is built to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, and my weakness is the opposite. I read it a one, two, five uh, loud <laughs> and have to force myself to slow down a lot. Um, uh, yeah. But it's for my own books. So I'm, I'm only paying myself. Yeah, I'm doing it. But even for others, you know, like when I did Troy's, it, it was probably a little faster than I, I was slower than I was reading my own books. Mm -hmm. But um, but still, he, he got a deal because he paid for less finished hours. Right. And and it's for mine. I like I don't want people to slow me down. I want them to listen to my dulcet tones at the measure which I've given them. Right. So, <laughs> Tiago, how about you? Since uh, you're saying you listen to the, the QC there. Uh, no, drink you see it. I won't speak oh, it up. Uh, no. What? No, nope, that's all good. Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, and... Yeah, I, I won't speed it up during QC. Uh, I'll, I'll listen to it, you know, the speed that I get it. Um, as a reader, if I am immersion reading, I find that I read faster and usually than the narration. So I do speed it up a bit if I'm if I'm immersion reading, and then I I mm -hmm. sometimes get used to to that speed, so I just keep going. It's really hard, like once you've sped it up to like one point three or something, and go back to one. <laughs> it sounds really slow, <laughs> really yes. slow. Um, but I, uh, I speed my comedy is that when I listen to comedies, like um, I, I go up to one point five, because then they become yeah. snappier, and yeah. and I laugh more as opposed to a joke that's given to you much slower. Like mm. oh, this is boring, but yeah, a good comedy yeah. at one five is fun. So I'd say, um, yeah, I mean, you you can listen to it at the speed that you like, but. Um, or QC, I won't speed it up because I want to. I want to hear the original performance. Mm. And uh, one last acronym here: D A W. Mm. Uh, Digital Audio Workstation. So it's literally just the software that we record into, um, of which there are many. <laughs> Lovely. So. We've had our chats with the uh, narrator, between narrator and author. What can the author expect uh, when they'd like to move forward with that narrator via scheduling research and, and getting that whole process going, the very exciting and daunting process? <laughs> Kevin, why don't you jump in? Sure. Um, yeah, so if we're all ready to go, we've booked, our, we send, I send an, an, an email just confirming everything. Because like that's always good to do, uh, and obviously a contract as well that both parties sign. Because as much as it is an intimate and friendly like creation process, we do want to just make sure that we're both protected, right? So I think a contract is really, really important. So I'd recommend everybody get one. Um, I think you mentioned my blog earlier, Kay. There's mm -hmm. there's actually a sample contract in there. So if anybody wants to look at a contract, you can look at the one I use, and um, and you can use that if you want. Um, then a schedule sort of saying what we're going to be doing um then diving into research of which i make sure that my author is always like email contactable because we could be going through and i could find either a problem in the text or just i, I have a question and i just want to make sure i can get that answer qu quickly so that the thing isn't slowed down um and then once research is complete i have another production meeting just to make sure that we're all okay for me, this is the most important production meeting because I want to make sure all pronunciations, all character voices and all style choices are confirmed before we start recording anything. Because to go back later and re-record is way more of a monster than I think anybody realizes. So I actually have a stipulation in my contract that says once we've confirmed in that production meeting, 
we're not re-recording unless I make a fault, right? If I mess something up, obviously I'll re-record that. But but all stylistic and creative choices have to be made before we start recording. Um, and then we do something called the first 15, which we record the first 15 minutes just to check we're all on the same page. And then once that's confirmed, we dive into recording the whole thing. I would say. Hmm. So actually, just a follow up question to that. If there is a character that is introduced past those 15 minutes, mm. do you do um, sort of like mini auditions for the characters that might come up later in POVs? Yeah. Gio knows I have a very nerdy sheet, which again is on the blog. If anybody wants to look at my research. Sheet. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it is an Excel monster. Um, so basically every single speaking character I'll make a note of how the author introduces them and on what page they first appear. Um, then I'll write my own sort of initial experience of what they're like. Then I'll write vocal notes in terms of how I voice that character. And then I'll make an audio note of them saying their own name, the first couple of lines they say, and then they describe their own voice in their own voice. Um, and so the author can look at all of those notes and listen back to them and check that they like everybody. I think the first book, was 98 speaking characters, was it? 98 speaking characters, yeah. yeah. It was a fun Excel. We listened to, yeah. <laughs> we listened to all of them and, and, and talked about, you know, all the voices. It was really fun. Mm. A beast of an Excel indeed. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Kevin started doing the research for book two and he sent me a message immediately. He's like, oh, a lot of new people here in this, <laughs> this place. So like, yeah. Yeah, the accents are back out. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was like, should I should I apologize or? I mean, I don't think it's gonna be ninety eight again this time. But yeah, we'll see. How about you, Andrew? Um, so I I try to keep like like Patricia says because that's kind of the same thing, right? Because we're married, but we do run a lot of things through Drive with whoever we're working with, so that I can upload MP threes as I'm going, and they could even start doing an early QC, like uh, we're mm. doing um um. Leavenworth case, which is uh, public domain right now. And as I was recording it, she was listening up behind me and basically do, doing some of the work for me, realizing how many, how much work goes into it as I would often record, edit, go back and listen before it ever came to somebody else listening. Well, she's doing that follow up. So mm. we're kind of doing pickups as we go. Nice. Um, which saves me a lot of work. But, you know, it, it's like when you're working with an editor, right? You work with an editor and like, oh, sorry, there's this there's this thing I need you to change. It's going to change everything. And you get in and it takes like five minutes to fix it. Like it just ripple fixes. You're like, <laughs> it can be the same thing with audio. It can be, you can have tons of bunch of work and a bunch of them are just, hey, you had, you did this line twice. Easy peasy, cut, gone. Great, let's move on. Uh, that's how I record. Um, so, you know, it, it depends on what kind of relationship you have with who you're working with is how fast can you kind of shore up each other's faults. Mm -hmm. um, so I do a lot of that. Um, getting those MP3s up on drive um, is is a great way to shore up some time. So, uh, I honestly, just follow Kevin's process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I can't get a hold of you, it's because you're you're watching him through a camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean in the like the the production and and all the meetings yeah. and everything that we do, I just I just follow everything and it says, nah, I'm happy with it. So and, until have, you have like, to my step own in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Until you still have to step in, you can just you know chill and mm. and sit back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is the fun part, and we talked about it a little bit already with Chris's question. But how do we decide character voices as the narrators? Mm -hmm. And and you're working with your author, you know. Is, is there something that will catch you when you're reading the book and, and make you go, oh, that person needs that voice or the way the author describes the character? Um, I'm super curious. Um, should, I, should I jump in? Um, go for it. Yeah, yeah I, I have no idea how you come up with your voices. I, I just listen to them and, and I'm happy. Oh. That's good. <laughs> um, like I, this is my favorite bit. So I, I'm, I'm an actor as my training and so when i find those people this is it's where my heart sings right i love i love meeting these people and i think for me the most important thing is that is that initial first reaction like when they come across uh, that at that first time you usually you there's an instinct there as soon as you meet them you know and so i'll definitely record that first instinct as, as, as a note to myself so i've always got that um but then something that uh we did with Jago's book is we we broke the map down 
and we tried to find cultural similarities in his fictional world to the real world um, and then geographical similarities as well. And so then we placed all the countries in some kind of like version of our own planet um, and decided the accents for each country. So then we had the accents down. And then when I meet each character, if I know they're from a particular country, well, they've got to have that accent. Um, if they're a particular class, if they're royalty, or if they're like, you know, a guy on the street, then that's going to affect the accent in terms of, of that. And, and then we're back to that first reaction. So we've got those sort of factual things of accents because of ge geographical, locational, cultural uh, situation. Um, and then it's just like, yeah, I mean, I mean if, if the author says like, he said in a deep gravelly voice, we're done, right? We're, we're just, it's everything sorted. Um, but, you know, I think it's really fun to play with expectation you know, because sometimes it's right to voice a character exactly how that first uh, experience is. But sometimes if you can play with that a little bit, you can really change the arc of a character. You know, you can give someone so much more um, sympathy to the audience by playing with that voice. And I think it's important to know that you have that ability in the story that you're trying to tell. It, we, we could have a 2D character and suddenly by choosing a, a vocal aspect for them, we can give them so much more. So I think, mm -hmm. I think it's that. It's the first instinct, but also what can we play with? Um, yeah. So and I think you, you, know, you have more room in a character who's, um, who is two-dimensional, right? And as a character, is, is, is going to be a bit of a character. You can play with a more extreme accent on them because that, that's their identification, right? Yeah. Versus your main character, is it a voice that you can voice that you can then play with the range as you're going because they do have not just arcs, but just in a moment, a moment where they're going to be overly emotional. If you're, if you can't make somebody with a gravelly voice cry, maybe yeah. he shouldn't have one or not cry. Well, and, and technically, yeah. right. If it's like, if a book, if a character has two lines, then right. You can make him the scratchiest Scottish, like, you know, you mm -hmm. can do anything you want. But if that person has to talk for the entirety of the book, um, suddenly you're going to destroy your voice. So there's a, there's a uh -huh. technical aspect in terms of, <laughs> like how, well how i mean crazy. in terms of like actors right you know you only play one character on stage right and then you get to play with that range because you're within that mm -hmm. character but when you're playing all 200 characters you've got to have some kind of room and you got to give yourself a break yeah yeah well yeah. and style of book i suppose as well right if we're doing mm -hmm. a comedy fantasy we can go a lot more heightened with those characters mm -hmm. but if we're doing something really grounded it would be ridiculous to give them those characters so i think not only meet when you meet them, but the style of the book has a massive yeah. impact on how far we well, go. Well, I mean, if you have like a Louis L'Amour book and the narrator himself needs to be a gravelly voice, now you got to play off of that with more gravelly voices. <laughs> there may be any difference. And then you're just, you better have a lot of honey and lemon juice on hand. <laughs> I love Trisha's yeah. comment here, unless you're Andy yeah. Circus. <laughs> unless you're Andy Circus. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I just say, as an author, it's a it's a joy to to like receive the voices. I, I still remember like yeah. two of the big voices that stood out for me when when I heard Kev do them were Lynn, obviously, mm. because I think he just nailed the character. And I, I think this this goes to what Kevin was saying about character, right? He he really just grasps the character and makes the voice kind of mirror what the character is, and and that's that's really why I wanted a, an audiobook with different voices and not the, the monotone audiobook, which is fine, but I, I wanted, you know, with the voices. So um, I really, really appreciate, you know, Kevin doing the research of what the character is and how they need to sound. And Iridan was also now the, the King Adrian's father. He was just like that, that voice. I, I remember just listening to it over and over. It's like, wow, <laughs> you know, how, how did he get that? You know, so, so right. And, that guy. He's a piece of work, isn't he? <laughs> so for the entirety or the remaining part of this uh, discussion, we're going to do this in voices. No, I'm kidding. Right, okay. <laughs> cool. I just thought um, that Anitha said, do I read yes. the whole book before narrating? Absolutely. Because um, if you get to the end, of, if you've been doing a voice and you get to the end of the book and the author's like, he said in a deep Welsh accent and you're like, no, nah, man. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah definitely read all the way through before you start <laughs> um so I, my favorite thing in character voices is when you get the the flip so you have one character who's presented as say you know kind of on the stupid side a little bit silly but mm. they turn out to be maybe like a big bad player later on 
that switch for you, if you've ever done that, how was that for you? Yeah, it's, I love it. I mean, as I said, it's just my background as, as an actor is that those are the things that we're most excited about, right? Is when something comes out of nowhere. And, um, and sure, there's a, I think the harder thing actually is when a character is, is, you know, hooded and disguised for the whole series, but they're also an active player in the normal plot. It's like, how do you, you know, it's like, cause they have to have the same voice, but nobody can know that the hooded character is that person. So all of that is, um, is a fun balancing game. And, uh, I just think that's part of the joy of it. You know, you have to figure it out and, uh, and try not to do like a Batman voice. Cause that would be ridiculous. But, um, yeah, it just, just playing, just playing with it and figuring, and figuring it out. And, um, and I think big emotional shifts as well are really exciting. Like there's a character in Tiago's book who is a really lovely fellow when you first meet him and he goes through some stuff and then he becomes not so much a lovely fella. And I think for me, I'm most excited about reading, reading him in book two, because suddenly we have this whole new guy. Um, so all of that is just joyful. Yeah. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew knows how the series is going to end. He's the only person in the world who knows how the series is going to end. I don't even know how it's going to end. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Because I'm, 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 I'm like, taking one for the team. He, he's my, he's like my sounding board. You know, mm. he's the guy I discuss ideas with. Him, him, and and my editor, obviously. He's the only person in the world who's not my editor who knows how everything's going to end. So, yeah. That is a big honor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and Kevin, I think that goes back too to the pre-reading the book, right? is yeah. if you need to know when that switch happens mm -hmm. so that you can play with those. I had a character mm -hmm. in um, in uh, Troy's book that he has his reveal, right? And um, so how do you play with him that he's got, you know, different from snide to the point mm -hmm. where they become evil. Mm -hmm. And that reveals, it's a fun one, but it's still the same voice. Right. It's just it going to be... It comes down to acting technique, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're back, yeah. we're right back to like, just plain old acting technique like how yeah. do we embody those people and how do we make those changes realistic well yeah it's just it's the psychology of Stanislavski and Meisner so um, and it's the interpretation of the actor too right right you know, how many different versions of Hamlet do we have yeah they're all great because yeah. they're unique yeah yeah so with uh, the recording process going you've got everything narrowed down uh, there must be some top things that authors should know during the recording process. Are there any that come to mind? What if the narrator becomes ill, loses their voice? Mm. Is there protocols for things like that during the recording process? Yeah, I think um, being aware that that can happen and the only right way to deal with that is to stop recording. If, it, if a narrator tries to push through to hit your timeline, um, either they're going to completely damage their voice and not be able to finish the book, or they're going to get a weird section in the middle and they suddenly sound like this and, and it's not going to sound right at all. So just being totally chill and being like illness happens, you take a week or two weeks off to get that voice back together. Yeah. Uh, and then we dive back on. And um, that's just life. You know, sometimes stuff happens. So just being chill. With There's that. interim stuff that you can do. I mean, like you could mm. be at, if you, if you get to the first half recording, mm -hmm. that's just permission to go back and start editing. Sure. But if it's a long enough cold that ruins your voice and then you catch the next cold right after that, because of allergies, it's going to have a point where you, you can't, or it's, you know, flu and you just can't do anything. Right. As long as you're yep. communicative. Yeah. Just be understanding as the author, is it, it's going to get pushed back. Don't make promises that you're going to, to your readers that audiobooks mm -hmm. coming out that time you know it, you don't i mean i've had some tight releases just on my own books trying mm. because i treat it like michael j sullivan does in that the audiobook um uh narration and, and edit is my last edit right basically mm -hmm. so i've already it's come back from proofreading but that means i end up with really tight tight release windows yeah. but and and, I, and it goes back to what we said as well earlier in terms of making sure everything is solidified before we start recording mm -hmm. uh, it I know, I know that there are authors that have, have gone like, oh, actually, actually, I want to change this. And, um, and I totally, un I get it. I really, really get it. But it's like to actually just go back and change this, even if it's like a paragraph, it, it does take a, a lot of work. And, um, and, and, and I, always, I always feel really ha like harsh when I'm explaining my contract and saying like, 
if we go back, I'm going to charge you. And I, and, I, and I, I don't know why I feel shy about it, but I do. And it's like, but it's necessary because if suddenly I've got to do like another three days of work, that's quite a lot of money and it's quite a lot of time. And, and I often book, book my projects like back to back. So suddenly if an author says, actually, can we just change this, the pronunciation of this one word, or I've realized there's a mistake in the text that we need to shift. It's like, we've, we've got to try and get all of that done before we start recording. Um, and you're also setting precedents for word of mouth, right? Because that, yeah. that author you're working with who then refers you to a new author can is already backing you up saying, no, 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 don't be changing things. He will charge you. You don't understand that. <laughs> and, and, and then they are, or so they aren't telling that same next author. Oh, yeah. he doesn't charge for anything. You just, just, yeah. just roll over him. No yeah. big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I am friendly though. I promise. Yeah. Evan is <laughs> the most friendly person I've ever met. <laughs> so uh, let, let's say then that we've got the recording done. Now it's off to proofing. What happens at this stage? And is there anything that the author should be focused on? Thiago, why don't you jump in? Yeah. Um, just make sure it, it fits the text because Amazon has this thing called Whisper Sync um, that they do. It's kind of like automatic. Like if you have an audiobook that's recorded, that's uh, the same as the text. Um, they offer the audiobook for like seven, seven fifty. Um, if you have the ebook, right? So, and, and they, they link it all. Like you can listen to the ebook on Kindle. And I think you can, uh, sorry, you can read the ebook, the ebook on Kindle and listen to the audio at the same time. They do this whole like sync thing. That's why it's called whisper sync, I think. Um, so, I mean, that's that. And, and just, you know, being comfortable with, with the final product. So um, I, I usually like, listen to it have the book open in hand and just just go every every line uh <laughs> man yeah there are random shots of, of babies playing in the background <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah just I, I i go i don't speed it up i i read like every line with intention uh just to be sure you know that the final product's going to be something that we're both happy with both, mm -hmm. both Kevin and I, because we're both part of this. And I think it's really important as an author to remember that, yes, these are your words, but this is his performance. So you're, you're in this together. I, I consider Kevin a, a co-author at, at this point, you know, for, for this medium, I, uh, he, he has as much power as I do basically, like saying, you know, <laughs> you know, um, to, to like give suggestions and, you know, on, on decisions and how we should, should move forward and all that. And, um, there's some words that I pronounced one way in my head, but I listened to Kevin narrating them. I was like, yeah, I think that's, that's good. It's probably better than the way I pronounced it in my head. So I just, I just let it roll, you know? And um, so the, that kind of stuff, I, I think it's really important to just, just be aware and not, you know, just be a control freak when you're doing quality control, because <laughs> it's not going to help anyone, I guess, you know, yes, yes. Be, be serious about it, be intentional about it, but also, you know, just, just remember that, um, everything's gonna be okay. It's 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 a it's an audiobook that's being professionally produced, so it's gonna be fun. And I would say, um, as an author, be patient. At that point, uh, you know, you take a a twenty minute or twenty hour audiobook is gonna take it could take as long as forty hours just to record it. Mm -hmm. And that's and also they're not we aren't necessarily doing it eight hours a day, depending mm -hmm. on the depending on the narrator. And then it's gonna take three two to three times that even possibly to to um actually edit it mm -hmm. and um you can bug all you want it's not going to speed us up because we still got to <laughs> slog through all those files and um and we can't watch youtube while we're doing it so it gets i mean it's it's a it's a boring set of weeks so <laughs> yeah, where you're just assassinating yeah, I, breaths <laughs> and, and i'll just i'll just compliment what i said of you know be flexible and all that, but don't be afraid to mm -hmm. say if, if you spot something that you think should be changed, like not, yeah. not like the, the basic stuff that's been agreed upon beforehand, but you know, Oh, I think, I think there's this breath, maybe don't go through every breath, but you know, this section here, maybe I this do. breath is a little too long or, or I, I thought about it in yeah. maybe, you know, maybe this part should be just a little more emotional or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And, um, yeah, just, just don't be afraid to, to yeah. have an, an open conversation with your narrator as well. And, and I don't know about you, Kevin, but like 
pacing, I think is like, the easiest thing for me to fix. Mm-hmm. Not not necessarily pacing and how you read it, but there's times where like you need I, I need long I do those longer breaths, or can you can you shorten it up? Sometimes even with the way it's read, you can just yeah. clip down and make something really punchy. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to fix. It doesn't hurt to ask us. Yeah. And we might say, sorry, that's no, no, not happening. But we'll also say, not a big deal. It's, it's, it's a, it's a quick fix for me to get in. Just give me the timestamp. I think that's, I think the openness is a really important thing. Like mm-hmm. if you've got that, that positive, honest, open relationship, then you can feel totally comfortable saying like, yes. can we do this? And, and then being understanding if, if we can't, but if we can, then, Great. So yeah, just just being good humans, isn't it? <laughs> Very much so. Uh, and and just a question here: Does this tie into pickups? And if not, what are those? <laughs> yeah. So pickups. Uh, so we record the book, and then it goes to proofing. Either that will be ourselves doing it, or or we outsource, uh, and that's somebody listening back to it for. Uh, mistakes in pronunciation, wrong readings, maybe just noises, you know, like your chair creaked or something like that, or a tummy rumble, always a tummy rumble, that happens. Um, And so then... your shirt. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so then they will come back to you and say like, okay, you read this wrong or your tummy rumbled during this line or whatever. So then we re-record just those little sections uh, and then either ourselves or the editor will... Put them back in and re-edit them back in and it's super fast and super seamless like, yeah. again like i said don't don't be afraid to like if you do spot a different word and it happens like the same way that authors have typos you know narrators can read a word differently it, it happens that's uh, why hmm. quality control is is to be done with like book in hand yep. open mm-hmm. looking mm-hmm. at the words always every time it's not just listening to it oh yeah yeah that sounds good no because the word might be different from the words that are on the page. So please do do quality control with your text in hand. Um, and if yeah, there are... Patricia will call me out on this, but I had the word assertion uh, in the book I was reading like 20 times. And every single time I read it as assertion, <laughs> so I've had to go back and fix assertion 20 times, which has worked. It's okay. But, um, but my, my brain was just reading past yeah. it. Because I have been there so many times, Andrew, where your brain just goes, goodbye. And, and you're like, ah, oh, <laughs> why didn't you read that? Oh. Um, yeah, and I think if there are any narrators listening, I would massively suggest outsourcing your proofing because just like writers and editors, right, it's very hard to edit your own book because you've read it 17 million times and it's hard to see those moments that might need shifting or were just plain mistakes. And the same for us. Like, if you're listening back to your own voice, you will just hear, you will just hear the thing that you said as right, even if it's wrong. So outsource your proofing. And we all know yeah. proofers. I mean, I know Jill, yeah. Jim Wilborn is a, is a proofer. Yeah. yeah. I get to say this every live stream. Proximity creates blind spots. Your brain fixes mm-hmm. stuff uh, that isn't there for you. It fixes stuff because <laughs> you know how it's supposed to be. So you don't catch the mistake. So yeah, I'll outsource the quality control. So let's say you've got it all done. Proofing's done. Everything looks great. You're on to the final stage. What happens next with the author getting it up for sale and out to the public? Platforms we need to use. Is there something we need to keep in mind? Go for it. ACX and find a way. It might be other ones, but those are the two big players. ACX works directly with Audible if you want to do Audible exclusive, which does tie you up for seven years. Hopefully someday they'll fix that because they should. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and find a way is almost the exact same thing. And I use find a way it's e- super easy. Like I have no problem hopping on with somebody on screen and just getting them set up. As long as they have an account set up, it's not that hard to get things set up, to get things, um, to get your book up there. Yeah. And now ACX is work or sorry, uh, audible is working with Spotify for their free codes mm-hmm. and they, um, give you free codes to, because of that two weeks after you upload, as opposed to waiting for after release, which made it just the absolute worst because we were like releasing day of and then three days later then the codes finally showed up well now we can finally get audiobooks out to you know k and other reviewers who want an audiobook early as long as you have give yourself enough time find a way does um aggregate much faster because of spotify i might like to add a little bit of actor advocacy at this point which is that um currently find a way uh are in discussions with the union because um they have a thing in their contract with the authors that says that they can 
have the books listened to by AI for AI learning mm. and text to speech. And really, that clause should be with the narrator, not the author, because yeah. it's actually the narrator's voice. Mm. And the only way we can get a change to this is if authors have our back. And if authors mm -hmm. write to find a way and say, this isn't fair, we should change this in the contract. It, we, that's the only way it's going to change. So if there are any authors that like narrators and want to help our lives, um, write to find a way and say, stop it. Give narrators control of their own voice. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, the market is pretty consolidated under like two players. It's ACX and Finaway, yeah. who are the players that actually do the distribution. For people who don't know, ACX is owned by Amazon. So mm -hmm. they do use that to leverage their monopoly. It's not monopoly, but you know their, their larger market share mm -hmm. on audiobooks because they, they pay you more royalties if you're ACX exclusive. And because, you know, like 90% of the ebook market is concentrated with Amazon, it becomes really hard if you pay for your own audiobook to to look at, you know, other options. Because even if like Findaway has has it in their contract that they pay you 80% of royalties, right? But they pay you 80% of the royalties that you get from a sale. And if you're not audible exclusive, then you're getting less royalties when you when you sell an, uh, an audiobook. So um, you're actually getting like 25%, which I think mm. is what is what ACX pays. And then find a way takes their their 20% out of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's how it works. It, it's it, it, it is like, please do do research. Don't take my word for this. But that that was what I the conclusion that I came to. So it's like 80% of the 25% royalties. Mm. Whereas if you go exclusive with ACX, I think it's 45% royalties, which still isn't good. Like considering that you get 70% royalties from an ebook on Amazon, you're getting 45% on, on an, uh, an audio book. Mm. Um, but unfortunately the market isn't really like that. That is a sore spot for everyone. It's that slowly shifting though, because like Sanderson was fighting against that, right? Yeah, and he yeah, basically yeah. took all of his Kickstarter money elsewhere and said, "Sorry, yeah. Amazon, fix your fix your attitude, and we'll chat." Yeah, like, good yeah, for yeah. you, man. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why that's why why Sanderson did it, right? Because if you look at the numbers, it's like you have this option of going exclusive and getting like forty five percent royalties over your audiobook, and it still isn't clear. Like they'll give you forty five percent. You you don't control the price. So Audible can just like throw your audiobook into a sale and then you'll get 45% of books that were in sale, but there's no transparency on how many books you sold during the sale or whatever. So you don't really know. It's just like you get this check at the end of the month and you have to be happy that it's positive. You know, it's like, uh, that's it, it. It's really hard for authors as well to just, you know, have, have control over that yeah. um, because you don't even control the price of your audiobook. Um, and most of the time, if people get it through credits, you probably get, I don't know, I think it's, it's, they consider like a sale, like the value of, of the, the subscription maybe. So it's like 14, mm. or whatever, but anyway, um, not, not to, to go too long into this, it is a complicated market and it is something that you should, you should research. Like it, it feels really bad to, to just buy into ACX and audible, but at the same time you are paying like something for something that isn't really cheap. So you need to, to like run the numbers and be sure that if you want to stand up to, to ACX and Audible, yeah. that you can afford that because yeah. it's, yeah, it's going to take a lot longer to pay back if you're not exclusive. And that's why, you know, companies like Podium go Audible exclusive mm -hmm. because they're kind of like the trad side of audiobooks. Yeah. But, mm. you know, the numbers just don't want to add up. It's really hard. It, it is really hard. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tricky thing to navigate, which is why we're having this conversation for <laughs> yeah. anyone out there who would like to to have a starting place in their research, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is fantastic. And uh, before we close out, we have one final question here from Chris. Uh, for the authors here, what are your thoughts on utilizing multiple narrators for a single book? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot more with logistics. Because one, how do you split pay? If one narrator is covering the narrator portion of the book 
and all the male voices or female voices and then the other authors coming in or the other readers coming in for the uh, the other half of the voices are they half mm -hmm. voices so and then how do you deal with how do you how do you edit that because that's got to be edited in so that could be you could end up paying a lot more than just the split mm -hmm. but more mm -hmm. on top of that which we haven't even talked about price but yeah. you know there's a whole spread of how much you're going to be paying for that for that finished hour yep I have no idea. I mean, I'm curious about this as well because before I I, I did my audiobook, it is something you you kind of consider. It's like, oh, what if we have you know a male narrator for the male voices and a female narrator for the female voices? Does that work and all that? But I mean, the way I saw it is unless you know someone like Kevin is already used to working with a female narrator or know someone, mm -hmm. I I really don't know. I mean, how's that going to work? Are you going to like? work as if you're you're producing two audiobooks and they don't really meet so you just get like this is the chunk from this person this is the chunk from that person then you mash it all together then you need a producer to to put it all mm -hmm. together probably mm -hmm. that would be the way but mm -hmm. i mean it would be cool to have narrators play off each other as well right because you know if you know what the other person's narrating then you can react to that i don't know i think it's i agree with andrew it's complicated it becomes almost like a play yep <laughs> In, yeah, which which and, there are there are audiobooks like that, right? Like that's how The Godfather was. I loved that book because yeah. it was done as a uh, I can't even think of the term, but it, it was a full cast. It was a full cast mm -hmm. audiobook because yeah. they had us. They did it all in studio, basically, right? right. You have enough people in the studio, yeah. you can do it that way. I know Sanderson yeah. splits male female between Redding, it's Kate Redding, right? And yeah. um, and um, what's Michael his name? Cameron. And they just do it by chapter. Yeah, so if yeah, it, but they, they're married, so. you know. <laughs> yeah, and but 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 even then they're doing it by chapter. So a female point of view, she reads all the voices, male and female, in her chapters, yeah. and he does right. his. Yeah. So then mm -hmm. it's just a matter of use, using the same, hopefully the same yeah. mic and settings, and they and they know their settings. They've been doing it for what forty years now. So that's I the think, way I've yeah. done it. If I've done a split in the past, it's been POV split. So it's like I, I'll still be voicing female characters that that female narrator yeah. would have voiced also. Um, it's just that we've split those those chapters up. And well, hopefully you've got narrators that talk to each other. Otherwise, <laughs> you can have different <laughs> characters, yeah. the same characters with different voices. It does sort of defeat the point to me if you have like the same character in two different POVs and they're going to have different voices because they have two different narrators voicing them. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a complication that I would move into if it's like your dream to have this, you know, but I, I definitely wouldn't recommend like trying that with your first audiobook. Mm -hmm. It's like you get some experience in there about where you attempt that, I'd say. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining me, everyone in the chat. Thanks for joining us. Your questions, yeah. your thoughts, all of the links for everyone here, uh, Kevin, Andrew, and Chiago are down in the description below, along with Kevin's article that we mentioned earlier. So by all means, go check them out. They are fantastic. And as always, thank you so much for watching and take care.